I received a question about 1 John 5, 18. And this verse says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So this seems like a hard verse for people like me and you that know beyond, of a, sh beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're sinners. But if you didn't know any better, then you'd read this verse and say, Oh no, the preacher preaching sinless perfection is right. But always remember that at salvation, your flesh did not get born again. Your flesh is not born of God. John said, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. The flesh does sin because it didn't get born again the day that you got saved. It was the spirit that got born again. Paul shows us the difference between the inner man and the flesh in Romans 7. Romans 7, says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It is the inward man that is sinless and perfect. That is what is born of God. In Romans 7, 23 and 24, it says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He calls himself a wretched man because of the body of this death. It's not the flesh that's born again. It's not the flesh that's born of God. It still sins. It is the outward man that sins. Because the outward man is not born of God. In Romans 7, 25, Paul said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. When you sin in the flesh, it has no effect on the inner man whatsoever. Because of the spiritual circumcision. Have you heard about the spiritual circumcision? It's one of the greatest doctrines about salvation that your preacher probably hasn't told you about. In Colossians 2, 10 through 13, <clears throat> it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now watch this. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So it said in verse 11, And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So at salvation, the Lord cut your soul loose from your flesh. And now any time that you sin in the flesh, the sin is not applied to the soul. The blood of Jesus Christ is on your soul. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is on your record. Sinning and abstaining from sin have absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. With this being said, let's look at the fact of how it is wrong to look at a person's works in order to prove they are saved or lost. Now, as people who uh, can't see a person's heart or the inner man, we can't help but assume a person is lost when we see them living like the devil. I mean, that's just how it is. But, I mean, Jesus Christ said himself that there are many going the broad way, the way to hell. You can't help but think that most people that you look at are, are going to hell. However, when it comes right down to it, what is going to matter when they die or what's going to matter at the rapture is what did they do with the Lord Jesus Christ? What I think about that person's salvation has absolutely nothing to do with it. There are a lot of people that I probably even think are saved that really aren't because good works can be counterfeited. So I would like to show you how well-meaning people will sometimes look more at someone's works as a determining factor in someone's salvation and not the word of someone's testimony. If someone can tell me there was a day that they knew they were a sinner and that they believed on Jesus Christ, then I really don't have any right to say that they didn't get saved. Coming to God as a guilty sinner and believing on Jesus Christ to pay for your sins, that's salvation. But now let's talk about this for a minute. There are some who are looking at works before salvation to prove that someone cannot get saved. 
Let me say that again. Some people look at someone's works and sins that they're doing before salvation to prove that they can't be saved or that they've lost their opportunity to be saved. This happens many times when a person is into some extremely gross sin like sodomy. Maybe even a case of a serial killer. Many, many well-meaning Christians will claim this type of person could never get saved. But in 1 John 2 and verse 2 it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. That would include the sins of the sodomites. The world is a wicked place. It says in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Jesus Christ died for the sins of every person that has made their bed in wickedness in this wicked world. Even the ones out of Genesis 13, 13 that says the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So, sodomy, it's a vile sin. But Jesus Christ died for every sin, past, present, and future. If a sex pervert or a serial, serial killer or a consistent Christ rejecter finally realizes their guilt of sin and comes to Jesus Christ and calls on him for salvation, the Lord is not going to turn them away. As he said in John six thirty seven, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. If you're going to say a person has lost their chance to be saved because of a particular sin or because of some type of deadline, then you're saying that the blood of Christ can't wash away every sin. You're adding a work to the gospel. You're making salvation about believing on Jesus Christ and abstaining from certain sins before salvation. There's no other way around it. That's exactly what you're doing. Just admit it. The only deadline is death. If you have breath, you can be saved. Today is the day of salvation because you could die in the next five minutes. Today is the day of salvation because you could get to a point in your mind where you just don't even think about God or salvation anymore. But if you did, if you did come to Jesus Christ knew, knowing your guilt of sin and you wanted to be saved, it doesn't matter how many times you rejected in the past, it doesn't matter about any sin you've committed in the past, God will save you. You need to get saved today. If you're alive, you haven't crossed any type of deadline. You can be saved right now. Don't ever let some preacher trick you into thinking Jesus Christ won't save you because of a sin in the past or because you've rejected one too many times. You haven't committed some type of unpardonable sin. But now some people reverse it. And instead of looking at works before salvation to prove someone can't get saved, they look at works after salvation to prove someone didn't really get saved. Now this is different than someone looking at works that someone does after salvation to say that they lose their salvation. This is someone looking at works after salvation to prove someone didn't really get salvation to begin with. The sins you commit before and after salvation are a completely separate issue than the salvation itself. They have absolutely nothing to do with it. A lifestyle of sin doesn't prove you're lost. It proves you're living wicked and walking in the flesh instead of the spirit. Now, you may be lost. I don't know. I can't see your heart. If you haven't believed on Jesus Christ, you are lost. But a lifestyle of sin doesn't prove you're lost. It proves you're living for the flesh. And a Christian is at risk of committing the same sins he committed before he was saved unless he keeps his heart right. In Galatians 5, Paul talks about the fact that if a Christian will walk in the Spirit, then he will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, showing it is possible for a Christian to walk in the flesh and not in the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, he says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now here's sins a Christian can't commit because these are works of the flesh. And if you're not walking in the spirit you walk in the flesh as a christian now listen to these sins adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness idolatry 
witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if every Christian would eventually prove his salvation through works, then who are the people at the judgment seat of Christ that end up with no rewards? You know, think about that for a minute. If you think that every person that gets saved will end up having a changed life and living righteously, then who are the saints at the judgment seat of Christ that don't get any rewards? Well, and I mean, and who are the who are the ones that are doing all this idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, as Paul talks about in Galatians five? Christians can commit horrible sins; they can live in that horrible sin. I mean, that's plain, plainly what Paul's saying here. If a Christian would eventually prove his salvation through works. Then what was Paul talking about in Romans 8? In Romans 8, 12, 13, and 14. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. A Christian can live after the flesh and die early. I mean, there's consequences to a Christian living for the flesh. And when you talk like this, people think, well, you just think a Christian can go do what he wants to. That's stupid. I don't think that at all. But many preachers point out the fact that there are many false converts who go around saying, I believe in Jesus, so I'm saved. There may be false converts going around saying that, but that doesn't change the fact that not every Christian will have good works. The temptation is to require someone to have proof of salvation by having good works. However, also consider the fact that good works can be counterfeited by a lost person. So it isn't just false converts pretending that they've believed on Christ. It is also lost people having good works in front of the right people to convince people that they've believed on Christ. Also consider this great fact that a genuinely saved person can have all kinds of good works and at the same time they were all done with the wrong motive and for their own personal gain. That is not walking in the spirit. That's walking in the flesh as well. But to everybody else it looks like, wow, this is a great saint of God. He has a profession and he has works and shows his faith with his works, but he never did walk in the spirit. He was trying to climb up the Christian celebrity ladder. But to, the, but to you, he's like, you think, man, this guy's definitely saved because look at all these good works. I mean, you can't go by somebody's works. I mean, you don't know 100%. God does. You got to go by their testimony. Do they have a clear testimony? Do they understand that they're, they were a sinner? Do they understand that Jesus Christ out on the cross is buried and resurrected? And did they put their trust in that to save them? That is the issue. This is how I go about the issue. If a person tells me they knew they were a sinner and they believed the true gospel, then I just take them at their word. I have to. There's no other way. I, I don't have super spiritual eyes to see their heart. I don't require works from them for me to believe that they are truly born again. Because if you start requiring works to prove someone's saved, it becomes up to everybody around you to determine how much good works it takes to, for, the, for it to prove that they're saved you become the standard of what the persons have to do to be saved if you require a person to have works to prove their faith then you have to put yourself up there pretty high i mean think about it honestly you have to have a little bit of self-righteousness in you do this if works are required to prove you're saved i don't believe i'm saved i don't believe my works are ever have ever been good enough to prove that I'm saved? I honestly don't. If my works aren't good enough to keep it, then how can they be good enough to prove it? Think about it. And think about it for a minute. You that really believe in the changed life doctrine, that every Christian will have a changed life, do you really believe that you you live good enough to to prove your salvation? 
And I mean, how much of a change does somebody have to have? Where, where do, how do you explain that to me? I mean, I understand that, you know, somebody may have been drinking before salvation and then stop drinking after salvation. But then they could just pick it back up again a few years later, get in a hard spot, be drinking again, fornicating again, whatever else it was. Would you still would you say he's saved or is he not saved? Is he living just living for the flesh? I mean, I, I don't understand how people come to this conclusion. If you require a person to have works to prove their faith, to prove that they've been saved, then you have to put yourself up there pretty high in this age. Now I'm not talking about James too. I'm not talking about in the tribulation. I'm talking about today. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5.16, it says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The big proof text to show that a Christian will have a changed life is in 2 Corinthians. And I know a lot of great men who teach this doctrine. And I don't have anything against them personally. I'm simply showing you what I believe to be the correct Bible doctrine on this topic. But look, let's look at it in the context of it. In 2 Corinthians 5.16 it says, Wherefore, hence we, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now note that in this context, it isn't referring to the flesh. It says, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. And then it says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So what part of you is in Christ? Therefore, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, it certainly isn't your flesh. Now, what part of you is new? It certainly isn't your flesh. You know that your flesh is called the old man. You also know that you have an inward man, the new man. The old man is wicked but the inward man is sinless. Now look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 5.18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He said, And all things are of God. My flesh ain't of God. The new creature is certainly not your flesh. It's the inner man. Paul even shows us that his flesh is wicked in Romans seven eighteen through 22. He says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I did lot in the law of God after the inward man. He delights in the law of God after the inward man, not the outer man. To say that a Christian will have a changed life because he is a new creature is to ignore the battle of flesh versus the spirit. It ignores the fact of standing versus state. It ignores the fact of salvation versus discipleship. When Paul says old things are passed away, this can't mean that a Christian automatically gives up sinful habits. Because he also says all things are become new. If this were referring to the flesh, it would have to teach sinless perfection. Just like 1 John 5.18 would also teach sinless perfection. But these verses aren't referring to the, the flesh. In 1 John 5.18 it says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So if this were referring to our flesh... As well, that would mean you never sinned. But your flesh isn't born of God. Your flesh is not a new creature, you see. It is the inner man that is new. It is the inner man that is sinless, and you know this. I know that you know this. 
Even the people who teach change life is required for salvation. They know that it's the inner man that's new and the outward man is bad. It's like they just forget when it comes to this topic. Even the people who teach a changed life is required for salvation. Deep down, they know what I'm trying to get across to you. The temptation is since they are living a crucified life, they can't fathom a Christian not trying to live a crucified life. But the sad thing is, most Christians do not. Should we live right? Of course. Do I teach that any Christian should just go out and live like the devil because they're saved? Am I teaching what I'm teaching so that a Christian can just go live like the devil? Of course not. Just like you don't teach eternal security so that a Christian can just go out and live like the devil. It's not my fault how Christians live. It isn't God's fault how Christians live. Now to go on even further, look at the rest of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What is it that doesn't have trespasses imputed to it? The new man. The flesh is sinful. The new man has the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's new. It's a new creature. All things are of God when it comes to that new man. All th old things are passed away when it comes to that new man. Not your flesh. Nothing changed about your flesh. When you got saved, you still had the same fleshy appetites for stuff that you did before you were saved. I guarantee you, if you were a drunk, you still, your flesh still would like that. If you were a fornicator, your flesh would still like that. In 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We were made the righteousness of God when we believed on Jesus Christ. He gave us his righteousness. And now our works, good or bad, don't prove our negate our salvation or earn our salvation if a man gets saved and he quits drinking alcohol is the proof that he's saved and that he quit drinking alcohol or that he believed on jesus christ the proof of salvation is the thing that actually saved him the only proof that i have is the word of his testimony it wouldn't be 100 percent because i can't see the man's heart but i'm uh, someone not drinking alcohol doesn't prove their salvation. The fact that he believed on Jesus Christ is more proof of, than that is. You know, anybody can quit doing something bad. I mean, there's lost people that quit drinking. There's lost people that can that stop fornicating. There's serial killers that quit killing. I mean, the Golden State Killer, he quit killing in 1990 or something and didn't even get caught until 2017. He went all that time without killing. I mean, he had a little bit of a changed life there. He quit killing people. I mean, anybody can quit doing something bad. Say that, you, you know, somebody turned over a new leaf. They quit drinking. They quit cussing. I mean, that's possible for a lost person to train themselves, if they got a lot of willpower, to stop doing something. That doesn't mean they're saved because they didn't believe the gospel. And at the same time, it's possible for somebody to get saved, truly saved, and then they choose to live for the flesh the rest of their life. And Paul plainly teaches that. To me and you, we don't see a changed life. The change is on the inside. I can't see how their conscience is bothering them about what they're doing unless they just tell me. So there's, there's a difference there. But looking at works after salvation to prove someone is saved, that's wrong. Looking at works after salvation to prove someone lost their salvation is obviously wrong. This one's just obvious. 
I'm not going to go into great detail on this one because looking at works after salvation to prove someone is saved, I mean, that's enough to show you that this is wrong. But I don't understand how someone can really read the Pauline epistles and miss the fact that a Christian is eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Paul's letter to the Galatians was about men coming in and claiming they were saved by grace through faith, but then telling them they were kept saved by things like circumcision and keeping the law. That stuff has absolutely nothing to do with the salvation itself. Galatians 3.3, 3, Paul says, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He's asked them that question. After you've begun in the Spirit, the Spirit has, has sealed you into the day of redemption. It's baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ. You've been washed clean by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you going to perfect on what Jesus Christ already did and make yourself perfect by the flesh? That makes absolutely no sense. If you couldn't do good enough to, to deserve salvation, then what on earth makes you think you can do enough good to keep your salvation? If you could lose it, you would have already lost it. But that's how people look at works when it comes to salvation. The best thing to realize is works have nothing to do with your salvation at all. And I know that the people that teach a changed life, they're not saying that the works save you and that works are required for salvation. They're saying that works are re required to prove it. But I mean, that's that's taking it too far with works as well. Our works do not necessarily prove our salvation at all because a Christian can live for the flesh, have no appetite for the Word of God, and if he has no appetite for the Word of God, then he's not going to live right most times because that's what makes you want to live right. The Word is what makes sin become exceeding sinful. And usually when someone talks about a changed life, they're talking about quit drinking, quit fornicating, quit shacking up. But what about just a Christian who just, all he does is come to church. He does absolutely nothing else. He, he may not drink and fornicate, but he'll go home and watch drinking and fornication on TV. And he has pleasure in them that do them. And he, he lives that stuff through the people on the TV, or through the video game. I mean, how is that showing that he's a new creature on the inside? He's not showing that. The new creature has to do with the inside, not the outside. Paul even calls it himself the old man, the outward man. The outward man perish. He says, though the outward man perish. Your flesh is not new. It's not of God. Uh, it commits sin because it's not born of God. 1 John 5, 18. The answer for that is, whosoever is born of God, that would be your inner man. The outward man is not born of God, and that's why it still sins. You have to realize your flesh versus your spirit. Your flesh still sins. Your inner man does not sin. 